I'm Jacob Busani. And I'm Jake Rosenberg. And welcome to The Power Entrepreneur. Today we have an interview with David Stern, also known as Coach Stern. David is the author of Are You For Real? He's a professional keynote speaker and an esteemed sales coach who brings more than 40 years of sales experience to every one of his coaching sessions. He lives in Brooklyn, New York with his wife and he's a certified coach with John Maxwell, the CTA Alliance and the ICF, which is the International Coach Federation. And we're live. Today we have a very special guest, David Stern from Coach Stern, Stern Coach. Um, so David, let me ask you a few questions. Let's first start with, tell us about how you were brought up. I read your book over the weekend and you know, I've read that you were, you know, at a really young age, you were an appliance broker. Correct. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, and I grew up in the early 50, in the 50s. I was born in 54, so you know you can just tell how old I am if your math is good. It should be good if you're in sales. But anyway, uh, I was not one of the students that really came home every night and studied and you know for tests or studied to learn. I couldn't do that. I didn't. I had pins in my pants, pins and needles, you know. So I decided at the age 15 that I'm going to go into a business. My mother and my father were in a business. So my mother was the salesperson. My father was the administrator of the business. <clears throat> so uh, I decided I wanted to be like my mother. She was a very people-oriented person. So was I. I was a happy-go-lucky kid, but I wanted to do more than just be bored in school. So I came home and I opened up my first business, which was uh, appliances. I was buying and selling used appliances, and people couldn't afford to buy new ones. They couldn't afford to buy old ones. People couldn't afford to buy new ones without getting rid of the old ones and getting some money to fund the new ones. So that's what I did. So I became a peddler, call it whatever you want. You know, it was like a deal maker. And uh, one night I came home, and my father found in the yard, I made this great mistake. My father found in the yard a refrigerator and a dryer or whatever was there. And he asked my mother, what's this junk doing in the yard? Now, my, my mother knew about my business. My father had no idea that I was in business. And he came up and looked around in my bedroom and found that uh, I had a whole story. you got to read my book of how I got a phone line. But he unplugged me. He unplugged my business, so my business was shut down like 10, 11 months later. But he couldn't shut me down. You know, what was going on was burning desire to work with people, to deal with people, and to wheel and deal, that he couldn't shut down. So I continued for the next couple of years to go to school, and at the age of 18, instead of going to work for my father, he was very tough, strict, I decided to go to work for a bank. And I didn't have uh, Google. We didn't have uh, little smartphones that we can play Candy Crush all the time. And there was nowhere to hang out unless there was nowhere to hang out unless I went to the, wanted to go to a pool room or to a, uh, a bowling alley. There was nothing else. And I knew that if I want to make money and if I want to get ahead of myself, I'm going to have to take care of myself. I'm not going to borrow. I'm going to, not going to look for anyone else to support me. And I started in the banking business, and within six months, again, if you read my book, you'll see that I became, uh, they, they sent me to school. I, I, I never grew up going to school. I did my, my English is my own. I learned on my own. You know, I still, at the age that I'm at, I still, if there's a word that I don't understand, I still ask my wife, I'll call her up, I'll ask her, what does it mean? Because she knows English real well. But, um, you know, I, I quickly got into a management program and I had to go for training and I had to go to school. And six years later, I was an elected officer, vice president of the bank. And from there off, from then, it was off to the races. So once you were the VP of the bank, what, um, did you start setting yourself goals by then or was it before then? I, I had set goals at an early stage. Where, did, where do I want to be? When I was a teller in the bank, the first goal was I wanted to be a platform assistant. That was the title. So I had to get from teller 
to head teller, and then to platform assistant. Once I was platform assistant, I wanted to be a branch manager. Now there's steps to take. There's assistant branch manager, different uh, titles that they had at the time. So I had to work my way up. It's called climb the ladder to success. And I was willing to do that. I was willing to put the time in. That means I had to be there. I had, there was certain work related stuff that I had to accomplish as an assistant manager or as a platform assistant or as a vice president. So there were rules and regulations and things that I had to accomplish, which I did. And I kept it written down. I had at an early, an early age, I was young. I knew I had to write these things down. I mean, for me to work in my head, I have this built in forgetter that's in my brain. I think I, we all do. Uh, well, you know, we might, but a lot of people have built in forgetters, but there's no way for me to remember every single day. So when I get up in the morning, first of all, I have a reason to get up in the morning. I'm very excited to get up in the morning, you know, because I'm going to accomplish whatever I'm going to accomplish that day. Now, there were days that were really boring. I couldn't accomplish anything, you know, but that's okay. That's, what, that's just a day. So this is another day. This is another day. Uh, I talk in my book about my experience when I was in the jewelry business about weeks that I would go out and not sell anything. I couldn't wait at 9.30 in the morning in the California heat, 110 degrees in the Central Valley for being drinking, downing some ice cold beers at night. You know, but it happened. But I knew that it's all temporary. What was the shift from from banking to when how you got into jewelry? I, I got I got a job in California. I was recruited in California in 1977 into the banking industry, and they were looking for New York trained b- bankers. I was one of them, and when I got there in May, they changed the law. The federal government changed the law, and they said you have to be open on shop. You can be open on Shabbos. Just your luck. And, you know, and so they told me I, I don't have to work, but I had to be available in case of emergency. I wasn't going to make myself available. And I'll tell you what, at 1977, 1978, $25,000 a year was a lot of money. It was a fortune of money for a young man to be able to earn that kind of living. And I had to drop it all. I wasn't going to come back to New York and embarrass myself. I, I said goodbye to everybody. I had a goodbye party. My friends threw a party, had a brand new car. I was going to... It was very, very bad for my ego to come back to New York. So I got lucky, and I got into the jewelry business. And that's how I started my selling experience. And it was amazing, an amazing experience. How many years were you in the jewelry business, and what took you from there to the next step? I worked for this particular company, Rheingold, for six years, based in California. I was representing them in the West Coast, in uh, California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Arizona, and Hawaii. And the reason I got the job was because maybe I was fortunate, I don't know. This guy, Lou Hirsch, who was the salesman for the company, he had suffered a heart attack. And he had the line for 15 years. And he had made a decision that he is not going to come back to the company. So they were looking for a replacement. So my so happened my cousin, who was manager of the company or the factory at the time, told me about this. I came flying into New York and I interviewed for the job. And I got the job. I walked home back to California with two big suitcases of gold jewelry, all samples. Had no clue what it was all about. I was clueless about the jewelry business. But I was willing to learn. And Lou Hirsch was willing to teach me some parts of the business, to get to know how of the business he was willing to teach me, which meant I'd have to drive down to Las Vegas. He lived in Las Vegas. And I was off to the races for six years. I loved every single minute. As difficult as it might have been sometime, I loved every single minute of it. It was, it was really great. But then the company closed down because of the markets, the gold market, and the way they were structured. They, they used to sell by piece, not by weight. Today, jewelry is sold or gold is sold by gram, by penny weight. They were not geared that way. and They decided to shut the company down. I was out of a job. But I was ready to come back to New York at the time. Six years later, I was ready. And I came back to New York. And what happened after you came back to New York? Well, I went to work for a company that a lot of people are aware of called B&H Photo. Yeah, you know, I, I, went, I went to work there in a store, and I quickly realized this is not what I want to do. I was trying to, when I was in the banking business, when I was a teller in the bank, I always looked out the window. Well, what can I do? You know, I, I don't like sitting in one place. I like to be out there. So when I came to B&H Photo, I was working there because I needed a job. I needed a place to be. 
and I didn't want to be there. I was very good with customers. I loved customers and the customers loved me. There were lines of people, there were people lined up to come and see David Stern because I would treat them like with kid gloves. I'd really treat people real well. I learned how to do that a long time ago. And I got lucky. Someone introduced me to a gentleman named Bruce Lloyd who had created a mentorship program. He had finished one and started another one. And if I qualify, I can apply and get into the mentorship program. And they said it would change my life. I had no clue what I was in for. Is he the famous mentor you talk about in the book? Yes. Yeah. So his name is Bruce Lloyd. And um, I'll tell you what, I was in for a shock of my life, for the surprise of my life. But it was the best thing I've ever done. I've done. I fought him, cat and nails, hook, all day, all night. I kept on fighting. Really, I was fighting myself. Because coming from where I come from to where I'm at right now, uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget this. He passed a mirror around. And the mirror was, what do you see? So I saw, oh, I see a nose, I see a face. He said, well, we can all see that. What's the big deal? No, what do you see inside you? Now, that was very, very dark for me. It was a dark space. So I'm not going to tell you my deep, darkest secrets. So I shut down real quick. But being a member of the team, slowly but surely, I learned how to open up. And that's when it shifted from being a salesman to being a superstar salesman. It wasn't just a salesman. I was being the best that I can be. That means I could be a real good guy, not just trying to sell the world. I can listen. I, I learned a lot of things there. I mean, I was there for 18 months. What was something learn. that you learned in those 18 months that you were there? I learned how to listen to people. First of all, I have to uh, consider other people. It's not just me. It's not all about me. The world was not created for David Stern. The world was created for everybody to share equally. And that I need to listen and try to understand what other people are saying. Not that, oh, I think I know. I had the attitude, oh, I know what you're going to say. I know. You know. I was like, what am I? My name is not God. My name is David Stern. You know, so perhaps God knows I don't. I had to make that shift. I had to change that. Where I had to allow people to speak whatever there was on their mind, whatever was in their heart, and ask them what they were trying to say and to confirm that this is, that I understand what they're trying to do, what they're trying to say to me. And it built relationships with, with socially and uh, business-wise. It built a tremendous amount of relationships with that. What are some of the, the secrets, let's say, that you learned in, the, in those programs? In the programs? A sales secret. Uh, well, the, the, the secret to selling is understand what it is that you're doing. I, I wrote a... a I'm not going to say that I'm, I'm writing my second book right now, but I have a program which is called the Sales Gym Workout. Now, you know, I know I want to go to the, sale, to the gym and I want to have big muscles tomorrow, but that doesn't work. I have to keep on going. I have to diet. I have to work out three, four times a week in order to uh, change my body structure. It works the same week, the same as sales. The first thing that I, that I have in my Sales Gym Workout is goals. I learned this at a very early age, a stage, I should say. What are my goals? What are my financial goals? And when I ask people questions, everybody wants to be a multimillionaire. Everybody. No one knows how to get there. Well, you want to be a multimillionaire. What, do, what plan of action do you have to take? If you read some of the books that are out there by Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, there's some famous people who wrote some books and they talk about smart goals, specific, measured, achievable, realistic, and time goals. So you have to really look at your goals, what they are, when do you, when do you want to accomplish them? And we are human beings. We all have different goals. Somebody wants to make a lot of money. Somebody wants to have a house in the country. Someone else has this. They have diff everybody has different types of goals. And which, it, and by the way, you can work on all of them. Some will come true sooner than later, but you got to work on them. So I learned that at an early stage. And you got to make a commitment to the goals. What is the commitment? The thing that I learned most about in the business of selling is that I'm always about building and maintaining relationships with people. I don't always have to sell you. 
You don't always have to spend money with me. I can be your friend. I can just be a listening ear. I was the other day in New Jersey somewhere, and I asked, I sat, went to say hello for 15, 20 minutes to the owner of this company. I sat there for two hours. I asked a couple of questions, and for two hours, he kept on talking. He opened up to me for two hours. And it was like, at the end, I said, when was the last time someone told you I love you? Wow. <laughs> and you know, I got up and gave him a hug. I didn't charge him 10 cents for the time that I spent. And I get a lot of money for my, for my time that I spend with clients. I didn't charge him a dime. The person allowed to talk. I got to listen and understand what this person is about. And that's important. That's what I learned. It's not always about dollars. It's not always about money. I am sat get satisfied when someone talks about what goes on with them and they can talk it out. They have a place where they can filter, they can put all the crap on the table and I won't judge them. That's another thing that I learned, not to judge another person. Is there a line that you draw between um, you know, listening and, and then like the point where you, know, you start you know, taking them on as a client? Well, it's, it's, it's a loaded question. I think that these people are going to want to be my client because if I have a good ear, I'll give you an example. There's a gentleman upstate New York who sells $100 million a year. That's his, he has a business and he's a salesperson, sells $100 million a year. So we start to talk. We just like somehow met. And we start to talk. I had no clue who he was. He had no clue who I was, although he knows my brother. Um, I started asking a couple of questions, and he started to talk. So I tried to follow up with him three, four weeks later. It, it was Shabbos, so we didn't exchange cards. We didn't exchange numbers. And uh, he, I, I told him, call my brother, get my number. He didn't. So three, four weeks later, I decided to call him. And after three, tr three tries, I got through to him. And I told him, I said, I'm going to be in your area on Sunday. Would you like to meet? So he starts out, oh, I can't meet with you. Every time I, you say something, I can't sleep for three weeks. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm going to be there in the evening, Sunday evening. So you got all day long to sleep. You know, we sat down. I showed up. Our meeting was 7 o'clock at night. I showed up 10 to 7. He says, you're early. I said, correct. And that's what I learned how to do. When I worked at Motorola, they used to say, when you show up 10 minutes early for an appointment, you're late. You got to show up early. There's a whole psyche behind it. I could talk about this some other time. When I sat down with him and he said, I got 15 minutes on the clock for you. As a salesperson, I have to convert the 15 minutes into more time. So I asked him a couple questions. He talked for 45 minutes. And he said, why is it that every time I talk to you, I can't sleep for four, for four weeks? I says, if you noticed, I didn't say anything. I asked you a couple of questions. You were the ones who were talking. I can't help it if for the last 35 years, you were stuffing your feelings and your emotions with steaks and all kinds of burgers and french fries and, and gefilte fish and everything else. You and, you, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden now I dig deep, which is my job. And all of a sudden all this thing is come. It's an eruption time. It's like what's happening in Hawaii now. You know, it erupts. Sooner or later, it erupts. He became a client. He said, David, can you help me? I said, I can help you if you can help yourself. What's my job? Asking questions and listening. Because I believe as a coach, you have the answer. I don't tell you what to do. you have any favorite sales closes that you use? You know, do I have sales closes? I believe that in order to close well, you have to be prepared well. There's six steps in selling. Professional selling has six steps. It's prospecting, trying to find who the client is, trying to find out is this the client that might fit my needs or would be good for me or do I have a product or service that I can sell to this client that this, possibly, this client possibly has a need. It's a first impression that I give. Then there's qualifying and qualifying is listening asking questions, taking notes, trying to understand what the needs are for this particular client, for this particular future client or prospect, should we say. 
And then it is comes to a point where to demonstrate, step number four is to demonstrate how my company, my services, or my product can help with the needs of this particular company. In the qualifying stage, I also try to find out how important and how quickly, if they have an issue, would they like to resolve that particular issue. So for instance, you're working with Keller Williams. Now, someone says, I need a house in a week. No, they say the next two, three months. So we know that you're not going to close within the next week. I know that, but I know that in the qualifying section. In the demonstration section, I also show them how my company, Keller Williams, whatever the name of my company is, my product and my service can benefit and help with these needs for this particular client. Then there's the influencing part. In the influencing part, how do I influence the client that David Stern or Jacob is the person, the salesperson that they should use, Keller Williams is the company or Coach Stern should be the company, whatever the company might be. How do I influence them? And I really believe that if you do a good job in prospecting and in qualifying, you're influencing all along. This guy is asking good questions. This guy likes me. This guy wants my benefit. So when it comes to closing, which is the last question, is the last part of the deal, it's really the beginning of everything. Because once you close, you know, so we know already when they're going to close. Sometimes in certain industries, I have a lot of life insurance agents who are, um, who were or are clients of mine or were clients of mine. And so everybody's having a hard time closing. I look at assessments. I have a, a, a thing called sales assessment that I look at, and I can see they're closing. They're very weak at closing. They're very good in certain areas. In certain areas, they have strengths and weaknesses. But when it comes to closing, they don't know how to close the deal. And But I also find out that this is what goes on all along in their mind, why they can't close the deal. So is there a favorite close? In When I worked for Motorola, it was, again, it was about the sixth step. So... I had a very, very high closing rate. People say, I want to think about it. And I ask them, what exactly do you want to think about? I go back to the qualifying questions that I asked to see if there's anything I missed. You know, and then there's some people who need time to make their decision, which is fine. You have to understand who you're dealing with. But I should have known this before, that you're a type of person that takes a long time to make a decision. When should I follow up with you? So I don't have a particular closing um, phrase or experience. It be, it's based on what goes on at any given time that we close. But the consistency and the persistency, your closing ratio is going to be a lot higher. So you agree with, uh, I, don't, I think agree is the wrong word, but what, like, what are your thoughts with um, like hard closures? You know, there's a difference between being selfish and selfless. If I have your interest in mind and I convey the message that I have your interest in mind, I don't have to hard close you. You're going to feel it. Hard closes, there are aggressive, demanding salespeople out there who are very aggressive in closing. They close very hard. And I've had clients who are very, very successful with high closings, but, you know, can they sell again to that particular client? And the answer in a lot of cases is no, because they say, this guy sold me, yeah, I spent a couple thousand, I want to get rid of him, I need him out of my hair, he doesn't know how to say no to him, so uh, let me, or her, doesn't matter, let me get rid of this person, but never buy from him again, would never refer to him again. You know, so... This is hard. There are hard closes out there, and they do well. Don't get me wrong; they do well. As a business owner, how do you start and structure your sales team? In terms like how many people would you hire? How many, you know? How much would you pay them? You know, so it's not just the J J O B, right? Like you say. Okay, so here here's the thing, and here's an issue that I get to see a lot with business owners in my coaching practice. I believe and I see that a lot of business owners are looking for order takers. They're not looking to hire a salesperson. They're looking for someone to go out there to represent them to take orders. I'll give you an example. Someone offered me a job at $250,000 a year. He's in the jewelry line. And I said to him, I said, okay, what are your products? 
what kind of trainings do you have with the products? I wanted to learn more about the company, more about the product, more about the training, more about the sales manager. And the end result was he didn't have anything. He was looking for someone to go out there to bring him orders so his factory can be busy writing orders. He had no sales manager. He had no goals. He had nothing. So I said, if this would have been a real job, you would have had a line from here to Connecticut for people to apply for a $250,000 position. So my question is, do you earn $250,000? And does anybody in your company earn $250,000? And the answer was no. Obviously, I, 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 would, I laughed at it. I wouldn't take the job. Unfortunately, a lot of business owners don't train their employees. They might give them a little bit of training. The employees or the salespeople come there because they need a job. Now, there's the business of selling. You can have unlimited amount of income. It's the only business that I know that you can have unlimited amount of income. But you got to know what you're doing. Now, the owners do not qualify the salesperson. When I look at salespeople, I say, what are your goals? I want to know what your goals are. So if I would be owning my own company, if I would look at a salesperson, I would say, what are your goals? Why are you out there working? What are you looking to do? What are you looking to accomplish? More than just I want to earn money, I need to get a little a good reason. What is, what is this person? What kicks this person in the morning? Why does this person wake up in the morning and jump out of bed? I'm excited. I'm going to go out there to represent a particular product. What product knowledge can I give to a particular person that they're going to be willing to represent me, but they really understand the product? And you don't have to have a full understanding of the product. You can always say, if you're honest, honesty is very, very important in the business of selling. I would love to answer the question. I don't have the answer. Can I get back to you in 24 to 48 hours? Go back to your office and find out, either from a sales manager, from the owner of the company, find the answer to that particular objection, but that particular question and get back to the client it might be good news it might be bad news it doesn't make a difference but your credibility is on the line you know so I think that business owners don't qualify their salespeople properly now when you started coach Stern what were your expectations and visions for the business so um, after different things that I've done in my life, I came back to b &H Photo and they hired me as a consultant to represent them on the tourism, in the tourism arena. They have a nice store on 34th Street and 9th Avenue. So they said, David, there's about 30, 40, 50 million people coming into New York. How do we get them in this, to our store to shop? I said, well, what do you want from me? I don't know anything about tourism. So the boss said, what do you mean? You don't know. You're always coming and going. You must know something. Hmm. So I took the, I took the job uh, and I started to think, how can I do my job best? So I started to put myself in the place of a tourist. I, did a, I developed a whole program over years. I wound up traveling to 12 countries every single year. I did this for 11 years. After 11 years, you were documented. One and a half million people a year came into the store. And the ones who shopped with a coupon, they were coded. So we knew where they're coming from, what country, who the tour operator was. They gave it, it was a whole program. And we did $30, $40 million a year in business. One day, I decided that I no longer want to represent a company and help a company make millions of dollars in profit. I want to help individuals. So if I'm going to help you, Jacob, if I'm going to help Mary, I'm going to help um, Marsha, whoever is going to come around my neighborhood, come around my area, I'm going to help individual people be the best that they can be. I no longer want to represent corporate America. So I, it was referred to me, recommended to me, I should get into the coaching business. So I had a, 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 a should, I, should I go into the consulting business or the coaching business? And the consulting business... Not, not that it was competitive, but like, who are you? Why should I hire you? There was all kinds of difficulties in the consulting business. And the consultants tell people what to do. It doesn't mean it's going to work out. As a coach, you have a problem. I'm sure you have an answer. My job is to help you find the answer. And I decided to go that route. And I started on a part-time basis to study the coaching. I went to school at night. 
I studied coaching. I studied the concept of coaching, got certified, and then opened up my, my uh, the first thing I did was to see if online, if it's available, the name Coach Stern. And it was available. So I bought it for $11.99 or nine ninety nine, whatever it was. I bought the name. I had no clue what I was going to do with it. That's how I started. I printed my first business card, and it said Coach Stern, David Stern, Coach, with my phone number, my cell phone number, and my website. If you went to my website, it says under construction, and it was under construction because I had no idea where it's going to go. It's now nine years that I have this website. I never, ever advertised. Every client that I have came to me as a referral. It's the best. It's the it's the way to go in selling. You know, let me ask you a question. God forbid if you have a heart problem, are you going to go up and look in the yellow pages to find a doctor? Google. You're going to Google a doctor? Or you're going to ask for a, yes, some, referral. Ask for a referral, someone who's been there, someone who knows? You don't, you don't go to yellow pages, I need a doctor. You don't go to the yellow pages, I need a foot doctor. You're going to ask somebody that, that knows, that who knows, who, who, who do you know, maybe someone knows. That's how, you know, that's how I built my business. It was all by referral. Never spent a dime. You know, today there's social media, there's Facebook, there's LinkedIn, and there's Twitter, there are all these social media. And I'm a member of a whole bunch of them, but I don't play, I have no time for that. I never, ever spent a dime. I may, Maybe I've done a couple of times, spent something on Facebook, but I don't even touch Facebook. It's not even on my phone. Twitter is not even on my phone. I have someone else who just does nothing but my social media thing. What I like is the LinkedIn part. But over there, it's like you get to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. You get to meet people one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, you never know where it's going to wind up. But never, ever. It was always, it was, I built my business on referrals. So did I know where Coach Stern was going to be? No. But I knew that I'm here to help people be successful. If you're stuck... If you're in sales, I have a lot of sales experience. I cannot teach you how to sell. But if you're already selling, I can talk about your strengths and your weaknesses and help you get stronger. My, the other part is the personal growth. What did I learn in personal growth? My own experience, which is all of my book. What did I learn in personal growth and personal development that helped me be a better salesman? When I started to do that, when I went on that journey... I think within a year, I got a job at Motorola. My clients were J.P. Morgan, Oppenheimer's, Bristol Myers Squibb, big companies. They were my clients. I learned how to listen. The secret is learning how to listen to what other people are saying and trying to get a better understanding. That person would love you forever. And it's been very successful. So why not? And now I'm trying to teach people how to do the same thing. So and so now let, let's tie it up with a follow up question is how did the results match your vision? And then what are some things that others can do you know, to match their vision and their results together? You know, um, I find that I have to slightly change course every six months. In my practice, every six months there's a shift. You know, I thought that when I went to school, I know it all. I found out quickly that whatever I learned in school, I had no clue what they were talking about. It took me a while until, oh, this is what they were talking about. This is what they were talking about. This is what they were talking about. I'm also a member of the John Maxwell team. I'm a certified member of the John Maxwell team. We talk about leadership, coaching, and speaking. I'm, speaking is a big part of my business. And, you know, it, and it constantly shifts. Every six months it shifts. So I try to help the people around me, you know, and, but my, my the, the the value of my clientele, or um, I, I would say the, the the type of clientele I have, is always higher end clientele. I've got clients today that earn millions of dollars in commissions if they're salespeople. They're in sales. They have a hard time with personal growth. They have a hard time with time management, which is extremely important. I have clients who are corporate, their companies, that they have a bunch of salespeople, they don't have a sales manager. As a matter of fact, on Tuesday, I'm going out to give a speech to a group of salespeople who work with this company. So it, it keeps on growing, it keeps on getting, so it keeps on shifting. When I went to California in 1977, 78, there was no such thing as GPS. 
So I have to take a map. But there was not one map that was good for the whole United States, a road map. I had to take a map that was good for the eastern, midwestern, and then the western states. So what happened if I got to a place where the road was closed for some reason? I had to do a detour. And this is exactly what happens right now. My business every six months detours, but it always gets better. My income gets better. My, my results are better. So it's always changing to the upside. So when people go through changes, the more you learn, the more you're willing to put into your business, the more time you put in, the better off you're going to be. It's going to change. You're going to find yourself having a better, higher, more volatile or money-wise clientele. So in your book, you also write that, you know, it's always good to kick back and take a break every once in a while. Um, how long is that every once in a while? Well, every once in a while is depending on each person you know it's up to you but you know there were times where I wasn't making any money I made enough money just to cover barely cover my expenses you know my wife and I went on a trip we went on a cruise for one week we went on a cruise we went down out of New York City we went down to the Bahamas and back for a week once I left the bridge under the Verrazano Bridge within 20 minutes there was no phone service. I put the phone into the vault. I didn't open it up again till I got back. You know, so, okay, so things are bad right now. Things are going to get better. They always get better. They always do. So let me just take a break. And we did that. We did it a few times. And my wife and I take trips. We take long trips to Michigan. Her mother lives in Michigan. She's from Michigan. So we take trips to Michigan. We scheduled one today for July 4. She's, she works. She's a pharmaceutical rep. She works for a big pharma. So July 4, we're going to take off to Michigan. And the 5th, 6th, and 7th, and 8th, the 8th is a Sunday, we're going to drive back to New York. We take this break, just, just the hell of it, because we can afford the time and chill out. Don't talk about business. Don't discuss business. We have nothing to plan for, nothing, just free time. I'll play a game of golf. I have my golf clubs in the car. You know, they're... Now I'm getting ready to dust it off. I think my next uh, tournament's going to be July 9th. I'm playing in a... Can you imagine me playing in a golf tournament? How long have you been playing golf? I've been playing golf for about 17 years. I'm, I, I'm a, for those of you who know golfing, I'm a scratch golfer. I'm not familiar with golf. S so scratches, if, if, the, if it's par 72, the 72 shots for the course, and if you get 72, it's called scratch. The only thing that I call scratch, I scratch my head every time I take a shot. I'm not really good at it, but I'm, in, I'm good enough that I enjoy being out there, the camaraderie. You get to meet new people all the time. You get to talk about your business. You get to listen to learn about others. And sometimes some of the best deals in America or around the world are done on the golf course. So I picked it up 17 years. I could have done it years ago, and I didn't. I wasn't smart enough to do it. But today I enjoy it. I love it. When did you decide to write Are You For Real? I decided to write this book um, a friend, I was already in the coaching business and someone had said to me, he said, David, you got so much experience in your life and there's so much that other people can learn from you. Why don't you put it in a book? I said, what, were you kidding me? Uh, me write? Writing is the last thing that's in my head. So I, but I, it, it, it was a little planted a seed in my head. And so the next time I met with this person, he says, well, how's your book coming along? I said, what book? I mean, in the back of my mind, I knew that she planted or he planted a seed. And I decided to shop around to look for a publisher to help me. What do I know about writing a book? I needed to go out to find someone who's going to help me write this book. And I wrote the book, and it took me a while, it took me two and a half years. A lot of it was procrastination, which a lot of salespeople, I know me, I'm a salesperson, procrastination is big on my list. Well, I'll do it later, I'll do it tomorrow. Like as you say, we're professional procrastinators. Oh, pro oh excellent pro procrastinators, very good at it. So, but it took me two and a half years, and I, I put out the book. And it's been, it's been nothing but wonderful. Nothing but wonderful. Is there any advice that you would give anybody who is interested in starting a book right now and procrastinating? 
Uh, yeah, there's something that I learned a long time, a little while ago in the John Maxwell uh, sessions. If you're going to write a book, what uh, doesn't have to have a title. Write down one sentence every day, one line. Watch what happens after six months. The way I learned how to write my book is, David, you have stories. You know, like, for instance, shrimp earrings. I talk about right. in the book about my shrimp earrings. If you tell me, David, I want you to talk about shrimp earrings, I can give you a half an hour spiel on, on, on shrimp earrings. Shrimp earrings is the title of one thing. There's all, all kinds of uh, 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 ice-cold beer. Talk to me about ice-cold ice beer. I could talk about... Uh, prospecting going out for clients in the summer nobody's buying anything and I have to wait till six o'clock to down a couple of beers ice cold beers you know whatever so you named the subject I was there just write down a bunch of subjects this is the guy who helped me the publisher who helped me put the book together it was amazing so don't think you can't do it and if you really really want to do it and I have a client now in Texas who says he wants to write a book and I said okay can we start writing every single day? What would it take for you to write down just one sentence every single day? And when do you want to see some results like paper? I'm not saying finish the book. Let's get, so get them into a goal of the book writing. And it's working out wonders. The guy's really on his way to, to finishing up his book. Wow, that's really great. So what's your opinion of a great leader? A great leader has a tremendous amount of people who want to follow the leader without being dictated. I will follow a leader. I love leaders. I love leadership. I would like to find someone who's better than I am and follow that person. Leadership. Learn from this person and go out there to do it myself. That's a good leader. It's someone who knows how to do that. Not to dictate, do this, do that, you know, uh, you know, that doesn't work well with me. I want to I wanna follow that person. A leader ha has to have followers. In other words, he's not a leader. He's not a leader. So now, to let us conclude, what's the difference between an entrepreneur and a power entrepreneur? Well, that's a loaded question. Um, I believe, I think... That an entrepreneur is someone, who, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who make a good living, they make good money. They're entrepreneurs, they're in business, you know, they're fine. A power entrepreneur is a leader, is a person who has other people in mind and want to help them be successful. So if I'm a power, I'll be considered a power entrepreneur if I'm going to help you become independently successful. Now I'm a power entrepreneur. Because a, power, a regular entrepreneur is a little bit selfish, so he's doing good, he's, you know, he's buying, he's selling, he's wheeling, he's dealing, he's doing everything, you know, fine. A power entrepreneur helps other people be successful. And if you have other people that are successful, that's very, very, very powerful. I'm very excited about that word. What's a power entrepreneur? Help people become successful. That's why I joined the John Maxwell team. John Maxwell is a typical guy who's a power entrepreneur. They have different people operating or working on different tracks. You know, the man is 70 years old, but I'm really proud to be a member. And, but he's, he's, he's got the books. He's, got, he's written over 70 books. He's really trying to help other people be successful. That's a power entrepreneur to me. Well... We thank you very much, David Stern, for being on the Power Entrepreneur Show, and we look forward. Thank you, Jacob. Hey there, entrepreneur. Thank you for listening. Make sure to follow us online on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Look for The Power Entrepreneur, or go to our website, thepowerentrepreneur.com, to stay up to date with what we're doing and our monthly events. We look forward to seeing you.